everyone. This is Kate. Welcome back to another episode of the Omni Channel Marketer. Today I have Vladimir from Better and Better, and we're very excited for this conversation. Vladimir, thank you for taking the time to be on the show today. Thank you for having me. It's great. Awesome. Okay, so you know, why don't we just start with your personal background? You know, what is your background? You know, how did you come to start Better and Better? Sure. Yeah, it's a it's a long and interesting journey. So I, I'm a first generation immigrant. I was born in Serbia. I moved to New York when I was six years old. So I grew up in New York. Um, went to NYU. Studied uh, there. Uh, did some corporate world experience for a few years. Big companies like Citibank, Thomson Reuters, Pfizer. Mainly doing like strategy, innovation, helping these companies figure out new technologies and new ideas. Um, when I was 25, I started my first company. Uh, which is a company called Rocket Hub. Uh, Rocket Hub was one of the world's uh, first crowdfunding platforms, so similar to Kickstarter, Indiegogo, but we were helping entrepreneurs um, raise money uh, online. And so I was one of the co-founders there, but I was also able to see hundreds, if not thousands, of other businesses use our platform for crowdfunding. So it was a great kind of, I call that my MBA, my extra experience in terms of both building a new business myself, but also learning about other businesses um, that that uh, rocket was successful, so we, we were acquired after three years. Um, then I started my second company, uh, which was a company called Mural, and Mural was my first physical product. It was the first thing that we were marketing and selling online, and it was a digital art frame. So we were making this beautiful pe pe piece of hardware, electronics, that we were selling um, online. It had a uh, connection to all kinds of art and photography to it, and so it was a whole platform wrapped up into this consumer product. And so I was the CEO there. We built out the concept from napkin idea through to hundreds of thousands of units sold. And again, we were successful. So we were, we were acquired after four years. And so that was my second kind of success under my belt. And I said, what, what should I do next? Um, what, what do I really want to build? And I wanted to go back to something really personal. And so Better and Better, I would say, is the most personal project, the most personal company that I've ever started. Um, it's really based on my own personal needs. And so I, I mentioned I came here when I was six years old. I actually came to the US because I was diagnosed with cancer as a kid. And so I, uh, my parents made the, the smart decision, the brave decision to come here and to get treated. I was treated at Sloan Kettering here in New York City. Thankfully, everything was okay. But um, as you can imagine, there are these long-term effects from chemotherapy, radiation. And one of them is a few different vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So I've been taking a fistful of pills for most of my life, and I really hate it. Uh, it's really unpleasant, and so I wanted to build a company that uh, has a big vision, and the vision is to get rid of pills. How could we build and integrate supplements, nutrition, even, even in some cases, potentially prescription drugs, into existing habits? And so Better and Better is doing that, and our first product is a vitamin-infused toothpaste that gives you clean teeth, fresh breath, but also a microdose of different vitamins and minerals just by brushing your teeth through the power of sublingual and transbuchal absorption. And so that's what we're doing. We're, we have a few different toothpastes, but then as we continue to grow, we'll have different products, we'll have different uh, delivery mechanisms that remove pills and, and, and leverage existing habits to give people the, the supplements that they may need or, or, or want. So that, that, that's better and better in a nutshell. I love it. And so why did you start with toothpaste? Yeah, that's a great question. So toothpaste um, is a very universal habit. Most people thankfully do it once or twice, sometimes three times a day. And then also toothpaste is um, in your mouth during a very kind of active uh, period. So you're, you're brushing, you're almost in a way like irritating your mouth, your gums, your, 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 um, um, your, your cheeks and beyond. And so it, it's a very absorbent period of, uh, of time. And so it's perfect for delivering micronutrients, uh, particularly uh, micronutrients like vitamin D, like vitamin B12. These are some of the early ones that we picked um, where there's a lot of science around sublingual and transbuchal absorption. And so um, it's the perfect time, twice a day, three times a day, per active period, and most people do it. And so that's why we felt like toothpaste was a kind of a great first delivery mechanism. Makes complete sense. It's, you know, an already existing consumer behavior. Exactly. So you're obviously a serial entrepreneur. 
Um, it sounds like you really have a personal, you know, passion for this yeah. business. But you know, how do you think about building better and better? You know, now that you've already, you know, successfully grown two companies, like what are some of the things that you've done differently this time around, or you know, thought about just like learning from past, you know, mistakes? Well, number one was team. So uh, our founding team consists of people that um, I've all I've worked with in the past. So uh, my co-founder Jerry, uh, he was one of my co-founders at Mural, and I've known him since college. Our other co-founder Mary, she was kind of an early employee at Mural, and we've kn I've known her for five plus years now. So uh, the, the the founding team, in a way, is kind of de-risked because there's no drama. There's no um, uncertainty. We know who we are. We know what we're good at. And we execute in a way that um, is aimed at just making the company better and, and, and launching the products, selling the products, et cetera. So we've de-risked or, or removed a lot of potential conflict uh, in that early team, which is often um, uh, could be problematic for startups in, in, in particular. And then the second part, um, I would say is um, just um, focused on really what, what the core benefit here is, which is a product that cleans your teeth but gives you a dose of vitamins and minerals. Like that, it, we, we've been really smart about focusing up on the benefit. And this took us some time, um, e even throughout the Better and Better journey. But after we were able to focus on this core benefit, we have seen a lot of success and growth over the last year and a half, two years. Um, and so just this focusing up during a world, during a time that is very noisy, there's a lot going on. People just want to know what this is and what it does. And so that focus um, has been really key for us in terms of messaging and in terms of bringing the product to market. Yep, focus as a, a founder makes so much sense. There's a million yeah. things that you could be doing at once. So. You know, when when did you start Better and Better, and you know, where did you launch? What channel did you launch first uh, as the, as the brand? Yeah, so we started the company actually in 2019, but we were in R and D for about a year and a half. So we were developing the product, we were testing, we we went through a few different kind of chemists, formulators. Um, you know, you can't just put vitamins in toothpaste. You need to mix it and, 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 and produce something that can deliver the vitamins to you and clean your teeth, and it has to taste good. Um, so it's this, this interesting combination of, of product uh, features that you have to make sure are, are there. So that took us about a year and a half, almost two years, and we launched the product, um, like a beta version of the product, early version of the product, um, in late 2020, um, early 2021. So So... That was kind of beta version of the product, and we did it on our own website. So um, we we felt that in, in order to provide the best experience and the best kind of explanation for what this product was, we needed to tell tell a little bit of a longer story. And the best place to tell that story was through our own e ecosystem, our own environment, our own store. And I, I think that's still kind of the place where you get the most control and the most storytelling power. Um, and so that's why we leveraged a direct-to-consumer kind of playbook of our own website. Um, and it was, it was successful. We were able to sell out that first batch, that test batch, within the first six months, uh, telling our customers, being very clear to them that this is, like, they're part of an experiment. They're part of something new. They're part of something, almost like, in a way, um, software beta testers, but they were consumer products beta testers. And so it, that, that worked really well for us because they were able to give us quick feedback through our website, through the mechanisms that we had established, and we were able to use that feedback for V2 of the product that we launched in 2022 um, that was, you know, upgraded, pushed forward, and, and improved in many different ways. So, you know, how do you think about the channels that you're selling through now, and, you know, what are those channels? Yeah, so right now, um, we are, really, there are three main channels. So there is our website that we're still continuing to push. Particularly, um, it's a great place for subscriptions. And so all of our products have links back to our website if people want to subscribe and save. It kind of, uh, it's kind of the home uh, in, in more ways than one for, for our customers and, and where we want to have them eventually end up no matter what. Then there's Amazon. So Amazon is this huge beast that, uh, for better or for worse, uh, is really, really important. 
uh, particularly for these kinds of consumer staples, you know, oral care, personal care, supplements, hygiene, all of the above, uh, more people search for toothpaste on Amazon than they do on Google. So it, it, in many ways, Amazon is both a marketing channel for us and it's a sales and uh, retail channel uh, for us. So it, it's, it's in many, many times the, the place where people first learn about our brand. It's the place where they buy the first product. Uh, but then eventually, hopefully, we bring them down the funnel more towards our website and more towards our platform. Um, uh, for a better experience and for the subscription element that I described. And then finally, the third channel now that we're expanding to is, is retail. So um, consumer products in particular are, are very much still driven by grab and go. You go to the store, you go to you know, a, a pharmacy or a drugstore or uh, um, a grocery store, and you're buying a bunch of stuff, and you're like, oh, I need, I need toothpaste as well, or I need vitamins and you grab it and you go. And so we quickly, you know, last year realized that um, it, for us to be the, the scale that we want to be at, um, we will need to have retail. And so now we have started to kind of approach retail, mainly through, distribu through the distributors first, but then going through there towards the actual retail locations. And our, our, we're kind of following a top-down strategy in terms of going a little bit more premium, a little bit more kind of limited first, you know, smaller chains, 12 to 24 locations where we can learn about the retail experience in the same way that we learned about the online experience early on so that we aren't drinking from the fire hose from a big you know, uh, Target or Walmart or Whole Foods or anything like that um, until we have learned how to actually do retail. So I think the next year, year and a half is going to be about learning how to do retail. And then after that, we'll do the big expansion into, into some of these larger retail locations and, and, and um, kind of go the full, full retail uh, approach. And what has been successful for your team in terms of you know, convincing retailers why they want to carry better and better? Yeah, so um, you know, in many ways, it's, just, it's very driven by the product itself. So uh, it's, you know, it's a unique, differentiated product that we're the, you know, one of a very few toothpaste that have kind of a supplement angle to it, that, that not only are you giving health to your mouth, that you're giving health to your full body as well. And so there's kind of a holistic health approach to it that I think is really unique. So the product is number one. Like, is the product unique? Is it priced appropriately? Do they get enough margin? Um, all, all of those kind of classic retail things. And then in addition to that, it's, it's really continuing to tell this story, my story, the story of our brand, in such a way that not only do retailers see potential now, but they can see potential six months, six months, 12 months, 18 months down the road where the brand uh, starts to do more of the lift as opposed to the, the, the placement that does the lift. And so I think a lot of retailers um, are really concerned about sell through. Like not only are, can you get into the store, but can, can you sell? And so if they can see the growth potential around brand awareness, then they're much less concerned about sell-through right now. They could see that the sell-through will continue to grow as the brand becomes more known uh, to, the, to, the, to the universe. So like, for instance, you know, one of our toothpaste, uh, for our fortified toothpaste was named the best toothpaste by GQ magazine uh, last year. And so like that kind of press um, obviously is really important for, for our digital channels. But it really moves the needle for retail because the retailers are able to start um, seeing like, oh, wow, this is a real brand. It's going to last. It's going to grow. We want to invest with the brand, not just uh, kind of test it or anything. So press really moves the needle with retailers. What are, you know, what are other aspects of your brand building separate from press or, or honestly tactics to get press, uh, you know, to help set yourself up for success in, in, in that retail expansion? Yeah, so one of our biggest challenges is education. Like, most people don't know that they can get, um, um, you know, their vitamins or supplements or anything, really, directly through their mouth, not having to swallow it, not having to, you know, digest it. The, 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 it goes directly into the bloodstream from the mouth. So, like, this idea is still pretty new. 
uh, you know, uh, the medical profession has done, has used sublingual absorption for pain medication. It's, it, it's even been used like for cannabis products, stuff like that, but it hasn't really been consumerized. Mm -hmm. And so the education element, I think, is the biggest challenge for us. So most of our marketing and, and brand building right now is built around kind of infotainment or educational marketing where not only are we just saying this is what better and better is, but we're giving them a little bit of a, a kind of an edu educational story behind it. So a lot of that can't be just done by us. It has to, we have to find third party, basically spokespeople uh, to, to speak on our behalf with credibility and with experience. So we're starting to sign up doctors, um, um, uh, uh, dental professionals, uh, scientists as not just you know validators, but also will be the face of our company in different ways and different in different experiences, whether it's the press or whether it's social media or whether it's you know talking to even retailers in some cases, we need to not only tell our own story, but we need to have others who are credible tell our story on our behalf in order to educate the consumer base and to educate the retailers that this is actually a real concept that is you know scientifically proven it's existed for decades. Uh, it's just no one's ever put put it together like we are at better. So there's almost a, you know, professional influencer strategy, you know, through doctors and, you know, dentists, et cetera. It, totally. It, it's completely necessary because the number one question that we get from everyone is, does this really work? Mm. And obviously we can say yes, yes it does, but it's much, much more powerful if someone with 30 years of medical experience can say, yeah, I've, I've, I've used this for my patients and it totally works. Mm -hmm. Makes complete sense. Okay, so you talked about, um, you know, D to C, your own website, your, you know, Amazon channel, a growing retail channel. How do you think about bridging the gap between all of those different channels, you know, as a brand so that your consumer has, you know, the best experience possible? Yeah, it's hard. Um, so I think particularly, you know, when you think about time scale, so like your site, you can update messaging in real time. You can update, you know, you know, we just got this press piece or we just got that, this uh, medical professional on our team. Like that speed is much faster. Whereas Amazon is like little steps. So Amazon all of a sudden isn't real time, but it's close to real time. You could, every few days they'll let you update the Amazon site. They'll let you change things and update things, but it's, it's not, it's a little bit delayed, right? It's not real time. And so then you have to plan for like, okay, I get, we have to make these little step updates on Amazon while we're making more of a linear update on our site. And then retail is like big steps. Like it takes months to update a display or to update the packaging or to update anything really that's in the store. So then you have to think of time scale in like three ideas. There's the linear on your site, there's the like little steps on Amazon, and then there's the big steps in retail. And so you kind of have to make plans around, you cannot make those big updates too quickly. You have to time them out. Whereas the little updates you can do on a more consistent and timely manner. So if something's really important and if something is gonna change something about our products or about our brand, then we have to think about it more like at a three to six month scale as opposed to a week long scale. And so just this, this like thinking has to adapt in a way that, you know, maybe not, it's, it's not custom or normal for a, a traditional D2C brand to think about, but we, we've done it and we've, we've done it pretty well. And did you bootstrap the business or did you raise outside capital? Yeah, so thankfully because of my uh, successful experience with uh, previous startups, uh, I have a, a collection of investors and, and, and partners that have seen me and seen us be successful. And, and so we were able to raise um, kind of venture funding for the, for the brand, particularly because it is and was R&D heavy. So mm -hmm. we had to invest a good deal of money in developing the formulas, developing the, in the intellectual property around the formulas. So it's not just um, you know a branding exercise, but it's an actual scientific product development exercise that we needed to pursue. So yes, we, we, we raised um, a few million dollars from, from investors that uh, were able to push us, uh, particularly with the R&D, but also with the launch and the marketing and beyond. That makes complete sense. Yeah. 
So, uh, you know, what is something that you are bold or passionate about that, you know, would be relevant to our, our listeners as other founders and marketers? Um, sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of big trend and then marketing. So for big trend, like particularly for better and better, like I think the idea of integrating health into existing life, into daily habits is going to be so important moving forward. Uh, people now have become so inundated with a million things like supplements and, and exercise and minerals and, and all kinds of different potential options, saunas and light treatment and every, like anything you can imagine. Uh, so simplifying things and matching them into what people are already doing into existing habits, I think is going to be so important because it just, there's only so much time and so much mind space, particularly, you know, with people with families, people with, you know, professional careers. So that's kind of the health trend that, that I'm seeing. And then in terms of like uh, marketing and reaching customers, I think it feels like the wild west again, um, in terms of how do you reach customers, particularly top of funnel. Like how do you get your brand and, brand and messaging out there? Because all of a sudden these things that used to be kind of reliable um, are questionable now. Whether that's the whole Facebook meta platform, which you know you used to be able to put a dollar in, you get three dollars out and it's great. Uh, that is really not lo no longer the case for, for most products and most companies. Um, influencers, again, like it's, it's become unclear as to what the ROI is for some, some of these things. Um, PR, content marketing, again, uh, unclear. So I think there are a lot of question marks out there and really the, the, the only way forward is like fast testing, uh, not committing huge budgets to any particular channel too soon um, and really just being able to learn um, almost like in a kind of, uh, a, you know, you're w wandering through the jungle and looking around to see where the, where the resources are, where the openings are, because there is no map. Like the, the map, I think, has been completely removed. And I think um, at this point, everyone's trying to figure stuff out. And um, there are no right answers, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, which is both an opportunity and a, and a challenge at the same time. And what's working for better and better right now? I know you're doing a lot of testing and there's a lot to learn, yeah. but what's working right now? Right now, in, in terms of channels, like um, treating Amazon as both marketing and sales has, has worked well for us. Um, and we're, we're really, we picked up some nice momentum there. So it's almost like trying to leverage that as both an advertising marketing platform as the, for the brand as a whole, but also obviously get the people to transact there. Um, Google has worked well, has continued to work yeah. well for us, just like good old Search. fashioned, you know, keywords and the whole Google platform continues to be effective um, for us. And then, like I, like I mentioned uh, before, um, uh, trying to get these third party high, high credibility um, influencer spokespeople on our team or on our speaking on our behalf um, is starting to make a difference mm -hmm. because you know, in the past we were a little bit more, you know, go broad, you know, fitness, uh, um, you know, uh, health and wellness, uh, beauty. Uh, but now we're, we're really kind of focused on these kind of credible health individuals. And so through that approach, I think, we, again, we focused it up a little bit. And because of that, we've been, we've been able to be, um, to get a better ROI. Great. Uh, on, on what, what we're spending. Okay, moving into our lightning round here. This is going to ask you a couple of quick questions. So, favorite omni-channel brand? Uh, probably Athletic Greens at this point. Thing you wish you could change about our industry? I think um, I wish everyone was a little more honest. Like, everyone has a lot of challenges. Let's all just be honest about the challenges and, and you know, maybe we can solve them together. Favorite podcast? Um, the Huberman podcast right now. Okay. I haven't heard of that one. I'll have yeah. to check it out. Yeah. Favorite it's more of a science, science driven. It's good. Okay. Yeah. Favorite newsletter? Favorite newsletter? Um, that's a good question. I, probably uh, the Lean Lux uh, newsletter. That is a good one. It's, it's just a nice roundup. Mm -hmm. Fa yeah. Favorite social media channel? Oh, boy. They're all terrible. Ah. Uh, I, I'm 
cautiously optimistic that Twitter will make a comeback mm. as as a uh, as a channel that will be used, more useful and again more transparent, maybe more honest. Mm-hmm. Favorite book? Oh boy! Um, right now, favorite book? Probably um, uh, I'm reading a book um, called. Um, the 90s by Chuck Klosterman. Okay. Uh, so a little bit of nostalgia. Okay. Uh, wrapped up in... in, in uh, Love it. In what I'm reading. Yeah. It, nostalgia's back. <laughs> uh, uh, favorite event that you're excited about going to this year? South by Southwest just passed. Uh, but I think a lot more brands will be using South by Southwest. Hmm. Uh, so South by Southwest in the next... Next year. Months. Yes. Well, Vladimir, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed hearing your story, hearing the story of Better and Better. Thanks so much. Thank you very much for having me. If you liked this podcast, follow me and The Bridge Page on LinkedIn and Twitter for hot takes and tactical advice. If you really loved today's episode, we'd love a review on the podcasting platform of your choice, Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thanks for listening.